Asia and Pamphylia. And you'll notice that when Paul, on his uh, first missionary journey, they left Antioch and then to, went to Seleucia, which is the port, and then to, and to Cyprus, Salamis and Paphos. Then they journeyed here and they catch a river. You might not know that, but there is. And the river goes right up to, in this case, Antioch. This is Antioch of Pisidia. Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. They were the four um, towns they visited. Then they went back and then they went back to report. That's the first missionary journey, what I call 1MJ. <laughs> now in that respect, the question then is, what are the churches of Galatia? Are they southern Galatia? Or are they the churches of this whole province of Galatia? Are we talking Roman province? Or are we talking southern sector of that? And that leads to two clear dates. When Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, as he does in verse one, chapter 1, verse 2, does he mean the churches of the, uh, the original Galatian territory or the churches of the expanded Roman province? Because do we have any evidence Paul ever went there in that expanded section? If we take him to mean the original territory of Central Asia Minor, then he passed through this area in his recorded second missionary journey. And on his third missionary journey, he cared for the congregations already there. He says that in the Acts. If he means the expanded later Roman province, then he founded churches there. They include Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra and Derby, And they were evangelised on his first missionary journey. And they were also visited on his second. Because you remember he took Silas with him and said, let's go and encourage the churches. And they went off through the Tarsan gates and across the mountains and into that highway. This does not affect the interpretation of the letter so much as it does the date. On that, on that, on that the meaning of Galatia has some bearing. There are two areas to think about when it comes to considering an ancient letter. Evidence which comes from the, the material in the document itself, that's called the internal evidence. And then there's anything we can discover about the letter from elsewhere, which is the external evidence. In reading through the letter, we shall come across the internal evidence which bears upon the date, so we won't state it now. The detail of the arguments can be found in commentaries and helpful Bible dictionaries, but there are a number of questions we can ask about the date letter as we begin. One, before Paul wrote the letter, did he pay one or two visits to Galatia? It seems two visits were paid. Galatians 4.13 suggests that. If we understand that when he speaks of the first time that this implies a second time had taken place before the writing of the letter. Second, in the visit to Jerusalem 2.1-10, the same meeting of the leaders in Jerusalem recorded in Acts 15, is it? Uh, 2, one, if, if it is, then the letter must have been written sometime after the meeting. So seating, see reading 4.1 in what follows. If it's not, the visit to Jerusalem recorded in Galatians 2.1 is, is before the one mentioned in Acts 15, then our letter must have been an early date, somewhat towards the end of the first missionary journey. Thirdly, did he write to the Roman province or the territory? 3.1. If provincial Galatia, then Acts suggests he visited the towns on his first missionary journey, maybe twice, and had another visit on his second journey then the letter could have been written any time after the conclusion of the first, because he says he's done two, so that would be the case. If it's territorial Galatia, that's the larger theme, then the first visit would be on his second missionary journey and his second on the third. Our letter then could have not have been written before the stopover at Ephesus on the third journey. If 2.2 two and 3.1 are assumed, then we have a date as early as AD 49, possibly written from Antioch of Syria, if 3-2, then the latest date would be toward the end of the third missionary journey, say AD 56, written from either Ephesus, Corinth or Macedonia. My mind has now gone in my later years to Macedonia, so I take a late date for Galatians, but I have changed my mind since I was quite young. Now, we, we have to do all that work when we get to chapter 2, because chapter 2 is where he recounts all that material, and that's important. Now what I'd like to do is just take you through some sections of this fairly quickly so we can 
have a, a, a good understanding of these things. <clears throat> and you can see that my main points which I'm deriving are the ones in the little booklet, so I, 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 there's not going to be a lot that I want to add. Uh, but I want you to look particularly at um, just the first five verses. Where Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and speaking of Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us out of this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Now this is most unlike every other uh, beginning of a Pauline letter. Paul normally says Paul, an apostle, and perhaps Timotheus with me, or Silas, and to the church at whatever, and grace and peace. And he normally says a very nice greeting. Here, he is going straight for the jugular vein, <laughs> because he's actually quite stirred up. Paul, an apostle, and then he says, not sent from men, so the origin is not from men, nor through the agency of man, nor has he come by virtue of someone else's intervention, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him, Christ, from the dead. So right from the beginning, he's actually saying, I'm writing to you conscious of the fact that you are challenging whether I am simply an apostle who's come through men, or that I've been sent by them, or uh, that I'm somehow just sent, my apostleship is somehow derivative from someone else. He said, I want to tell you, it is not. I've, I've come as a direct commission through Jesus Christ, God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So you wouldn't be wrong if you said, is his apostleship under threat? The answer is most assuredly it is. And by the end of chapter 1, you'll see why. And by chapter 2, he's defending himself for almost the whole of the chapter, with the exception of the last couple of verses. And so um, don't be surprised that he is actually uh, in a difficult place. Now, if this is the case, we're in a, the reason I'm reading this here is because we've just finished 2 Corinthians. And so 1 Corinthians has been written, and then Paul has gone, he's written that from Ephesus, and, uh, and he's written that from Ephesus across the road to Corinth, and he's gone off on this journey. And somewhere in here in Macedonia, Titus, do you remember, found him, and he was so encouraged by Titus's coming, and our perception would be that he writes Galatians now. Well, we know he writes 2 Corinthians immediately. So before he gets to Corinth again, he is writing from somewhere in Macedonia, oh, Titus has just turned up, it's really refreshed my spirit, and I'm going to handle these false apostles who are giving me such a hard time with you Corinthians, and he answers that, and we've just dealt with that in our readings. And so we're understanding him to writing at the end of writing 2 Corinthians, he now writes Galatians straight off. So he must have found something that, that these, uh, these false apostles are actually working also even in Galatia and that the Galatians have started to change their mind. Now the Corinthians, he understands, are not changing their mind but they're under great threat from people who says that Paul is really really a bit two-faced. He sort of uh, he writes real heavy stuff but he's really a bit of a meek dude and he explains his meekness as fundamentally power but with these with the Galatian churches they've already started to shift so he writes a really burning fast letter and it's very abbreviated very tight and Romans which is going to be written from Corinth as he gets there so these are all written pretty quickly and it's important to see that they have certain constancy of uh, material but if, if you understand Galatians to be a little Romans, before you read Romans, then you won't go far wrong in reading your Romans. Now, the difficulty is, though, if you've read your Romans, you can read Galatians easily. And if you haven't, it's, it's rather compact. It's very, very terse and very condensed. And there are condensed sections, not the least of which is the famous 221. I have been crucified with Christ... One, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Two, and the life I now live in the flesh. Three, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Four, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Well, well, that's Romans 6, 7 and 8 in a a verse. And it's very cryptic. And to know what that means, you'd have to have some good ideas from Romans. (coughs) But it's not where we are right now. Now, I give a sort of an argument flow. I was writing argument flows by then in my thinking. And um, I've picked up two... I'm just. I'm going to pick up the points of my booklet. Uh, he tells them that they're deserting um, because by, by chapter six, by one six, he says, "I'm amazed you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel." So obviously they're on the road. They're, they've begun to change their mind, and he is writing very urgently. And that's why he gives them no quarter. He cuts straight to the chase and gets on with it. But notice that in the first section. He wants them to understand um, the authority of God and his messengers. So first of all, he tells you, I am an apostle and I'm not sent by men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. You better believe it because my, my apostleship is uh, genuine, authentic, and I am the real deal. And what I told you about the gospel you heard um, uh, is in fact... That's the only gospel you should ever believe, what I told you. Now, this is pretty strong. What he's saying is, it's my gospel, because he actually calls it my gospel later on. He says, it's my gospel that's true. Everything else that doesn't square with that, chuck it. Now, this is such an important theme for us, because we are not people who have had an apostle lay down our thinking. We've actually had pretty dodgy stuff told to us most of our lives. And so we read his letter as a correction to what we've learned. And in that sense, we are worse off than the Galatians because we didn't hear from Paul. But we are not worse off because we're not deserting from something true blue to some, that's an expression, you know, something, something genuine to something which is spurious. This is a much more disturbing thing. He's actually saying, you heard it from me and now I believe you need to understand some things about me. So he talks about his authority and that his authority is from Jesus Christ. Do you hear me? You hear Jesus Christ's material. Second, the gospel is from the Father and through the Son and by the Spirit. So he's got a very Trinitarian understanding of how these things come. Uh, He tells you that the historical death of Jesus is actually a deliverance. He gave himself for our sins. But the text reads, on account of our sins, for and on behalf of our sins. And so it's quite important to understand that he um, he is making clear that Jesus Christ gave himself on behalf of our sins. And this is such an important thing to have clear because he wants to say, and he has a purpose, and his purpose clause is that he might deliver us out of this present, excuse me, evil age or the present standing age, the one that's here right now, um, according to the will of God, our Father, to whom be glory forever. What does it mean to say that Jesus Christ delivers us from a present evil age? It's a funny way to put things. And if we hadn't done, uh, let's say, 1 and 2 Corinthians, we would have said, oh, we're not so sure we've got this very clear. But do you remember he's actually saying, with the coming of Christ, a new age has dawned. And this new age that has dawned is the age of the new man, the old man, which is a collective term for people as they are under Adam, the old man has died um, and the new man has come in Jesus Christ and he is the new age and it's he himself who's given us himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil age and according to the will of God. So we've been saved from an age which is now evil and is passing away. And so he understands that. And why does he want to say this to them? Because he wants to assert for the, for the Galatians 
that actually they have already been granted to stand in a new place. <laughs> and he said, it's not as if you just heard an idea. The gospel is not just a message. It's a thing that works a change. But it works a change not first in us. It works a change because Jesus Christ has worked a change and has brought the old age to its end. And in that respect, the old age is the age which is pre-resurrection. And the resurrection of Christ has ushered in a new age. Now, that's what we saw, remember, in 1 Corinthians? We talked about that where uh, he was the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, Jesus Christ is the first fruit that's fallen off the tree as the new, risen, new man. And the new man, the new humanity, we are a guaranteed crop of this first fruit. In fact, we are one set of crop. We are, as it were, not... As, as, I, as I said it there, it's not two events, it's two episodes of the one event and one which is yet to come. But the point is that if Christ is risen, then, then nothing is more certain that we will rise. So he's talking to the Galatians, you have actually been delivered from the present evil age. You've, you, you've been taken out of that. Now, why would you want to establish that? It's because he wants them, I think, to understand the liberty of sonship. They've actually been brought into another age, another, another place has dawned for us. And this is what we're experiencing. And so there is a new creation and all this is for God's glory. So his opening, um, what would you say? His opening brief, his opening uh, greeting uh, is, it's there, there is a greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, but uh, he, he wants them right from the beginning to know it's about me, isn't it? It's about whether I'm a true apostle or not. And if I am, then what you've heard is crystal clear and right on. Anything else, you should test by my stuff, not test my stuff by somebody else. So he's very, he's very, he's very urgent and he's fairly antsy about what he's on about. He's got, he's got something to say. In verses 6 to 10, I'm going on unless you ask me things. I'm, just, uh, I'm driving on like some uh, uh, train. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him, or turning renegades, is perhaps the way that the Greek text would read, that you're turning renegade against him who called you by the grace of Christ and you're deserting him for a different gospel, which, which is really not another, meaning you can't have a different gospel. There's only one, but he puts it this way, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. For I am now seeking the favour of men, am I, or of God? Am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant or a slave of Christ. He asks that seeking the favour of men, verse 10, because the false apostles have actually raised what looked like a contradiction in Paul. And we'll come to see that. The contradiction is that he circumcised Timothy and, uh, and, and, and uh, himself and with four others. And he shaved his head and he took a vow. We'll come back to that. Now that would assume a late date. You appreciate it. Well, what is all this about? I don't know how it was for you, but the first time you hear the gospel is the first thing you stay with. Pretty much. You know when you're sort of starting to read something, perhaps it's for a course of study or something, or the first book you read is your starting place. If you picked up a good one at the start, You've been well served. If you picked up a rubbish book, every other book you've read corrects it 
until you finally get the message that you started, you started with really a rotten book. <laughs> now, I don't know whether you've noticed that, but it's true, it's true in theology. If you, the first place you go to sets your criteria for the testing of the next place. And this is a very important issue because when people hear a spurious gospel for the first time, that's the thing they build their life on until it crashes until it doesn't work anymore, or until it, it falls over. And then they have to regroup and hope they find someone to teach them out of it and do it better than the original evangelist did. So the evangelist is a very significant person. He's the first voice you hear. And in this case, Paul is saying, and I was the first voice you heard, and what I told you was right on. I'm amazed you would desert God who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. I can't believe you would do that. And I think the people who are doing it to disturbing you should be accursed. Very strong language. And he is in no way, he says, if it was, if it was even though it was that we ourselves had changed our mind, or an angel from heaven should have preached to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached to you, let him be accursed. Now, why is that? It's because the first gospel you hear sets your conscience on a whole range of things. So, for example, if you've heard a gospel of works which says you need to perform well or God won't accept you, well, then you'll set your conscience by that. And you'll find it very difficult to hear a gospel of grace which would sound to you too easy, too slack, too libertarian. Uh, if you heard a gospel of grace first, well, then you've been drawn by Jesus Christ to love him because you actually understand that he has changed you by the graciousness of his acceptance of you as a gift. But what if you haven't heard that? What if you've heard a gospel of law? Uh, well, then your whole understanding of the Christian life is you need to perform. You need to do well. And, and if you don't do well, you're not going to make it. Or perhaps you've been taught a gospel which actually said you, you need to respond to Jesus. And if you make a decision for Christ, that's what makes you a Christian well, then you'll always believe that you made yourself a Christian by your own decision. And, and the answer is all of these are distortions. They're actually, they're not, they're, they've got half-truths in them. You do need to make the decision to follow Christ for yourself. You do. But you never make it by yourself. And in which case, it's really important to see that, that there are distortions. Now, our generation has actually had the wrong message, generally speaking. And to hear this man's message is to say... Oh, my goodness, this is a, this is a releasing joy. Hey, but what if it's the other way round? You'd heard something proper, and then you, you went for something which was less than that. Uh, Paul says, that's unbelievable. Now, you've got to get this right or you'll misunderstand Galatians and you'll find it a very difficult book. See, he thinks the gospel of grace works a change in people by a gracious gift of God by the Spirit, and he thinks that they've already got that. Example, chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of law or by hearing with faith? Are you so stupid or foolish, having begun by the Spirit, you're now going to be perfected and finished off by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he then who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? The obvious answer he wants is by hearing with faith. And his whole point is, you know this. You've received Holy Spirit. You've seen miracles in your com communities. You've actually seen all the power of God and you're getting on with living the Christian life by not working your butt off to be right with God. So why are you starting to do that now? That's crazy. In other words, he is presuming they actually know the proper uh, registrations inside themselves that the gospel brings. Now, it's different for us. We've actually never heard of Paul. We've heard distortion after distortion. And we, we come back to the scriptures to learn, is what we've heard right? Because it's not working. I don't feel very safe. 
I don't feel very much a child of God and I'm working like crazy and I'm just feeling like I'm getting worse. Then all the experiences in our hearts are wrong. They're all the wrong way around. And so we need to hear that it's not like that at all. We've been sold a lemon. That's an expression which means... You know what that means, right? And if we've been sold a lemon, uh, well, then we, what we do is we read Galatians to get the right answer. But he's, but he's so upset with them because they've had the right answer from day one. And this is very important because the gospel you first hear has astonishing power to set your mind. You carry the baggage with you if it wasn't good. And none of us have really received a... Uh, a pretty true reading of the gospel. We've had lots of overload, religious overloads. We've got all sorts of other stuff. All of us have got that sort of baggage. But the important question to understand is, what's meant to happen inside me if I am a child of God? Is, is this how it looks? And he says, yeah, you people have had the real thing. You, you, you know it. How could you ever turn back to this nonsense? which cuts across everything, takes you back to Judaism, takes you back to works, takes you back to exhaustion, takes you back to no assurance, takes you back to getting un unsound, unsound in yourself, and, and, it'll, and it'll give you no help in fighting the flesh. So that's his basic, that's his letter. <laughs> it's really saying, I, I'm astounded, I'm just amazed that you so quickly deserted him. So this opens for us a very important door. Verse 8 means, if you've heard the gospel, your first hearing, whether it's good or bad in our case, becomes the test of everything else you hear. That's just true in life, isn't it? Uh, if you fall in love with a person, your first perceptions of them you spend the rest of your life making sure that that's what I have always known. And those first impressions are either confirmed or they're not. And if someone was tricking you, then you've been sold a lemon and real life starts to unfold a reality that wasn't there. Now, it's the same is true with relationships, it's true with the gospel, and it's true with God. If you say to God, well, I'm here because I've decided to follow Jesus, that's why I'm a Christian, uh, and therefore that's, that's, that's me, and I'm here, and I did choose you, God, and may, my goodness, you owe me. Uh, well, then, if you go down that road, God will soon have to teach you that he doesn't, but he has no way to teach you that unless he overwhelms the first message you heard. And there's something about the first that's more potent than anything. Until it falls apart, then people start to say, ah, this is not working. I think I should reconsider. Perhaps I'll read the Bible again and see if I, it was right. And I think most of us have done that in some way, large or small. But this is quite important. Who you first hear sets your thing. And so it's a great privilege to actually have someone evangelise you who was a true apostle, a true evangelist, with a true gospel. That's an amazing privilege. And, uh, and it's really very thrilling to do that. I, 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 for myself, I just give thanks for the man who evangelised me when I was 13, 14, and he just taught me things that were good. Good. And but well, he's a Bible man, he just took me to the Bible, really. But what's important was they were good. And I was very blessed to have that. So I didn't have to undo lots of stuff. He had baggage, which was his own, which I did undo, or the Lord did. But but as to the gospel, that was not the case. So this is very important for Paul and and you and it's helpful for us as readers of the gospel excuse me, as the readers of Galatians, to know that it hasn't always been that way for us. We didn't start with a pure, off with a pure offer. We got a mixed offer and had to see its purity uh, tested in our later life. So don't be put off if you have found in your life there are some things you first were taught which you have found don't, don't work or are not sense or I don't know anything about that or it doesn't come into my life or it doesn't make a change that may imply what you heard wasn't good. It may also mean that you're not obedient to what you already know. Each of us is in that place. But for the Galatians, what I'm, what I'm hoping to get across to you tonight is that is not the place they're in. They've had a fabulous start. 
with lots of miracles and power statements by the Holy Spirit. Uh, a great change of life, chapter 3, verse 1. And he's going on to say, and, and now you're abandoning all that for this Judaistic material that's coming out of these Jerusalem operators? I can't believe that you would do that. And so he launches uh, uh, almost immediately at 111 with a defence of his apostleship because you can see what's happening now. Uh, by the way, verse 10 makes some, <coughs> some sense. He says, am I now seeking the favour of men, which is what they're saying I am. I'm a, I'm a man pleaser. Or is it God? No, he said. If I'm striving to please men, then I wouldn't be a bond servant of Christ. So he's saying they're mutually exclusive categories. You cannot seek the favour of men and, and or God at, at the same time. It must be one or the other. And he said, I would not be a bondservant of Christ if I did seek the favour of men. So he's opened with a strong accursedness of the propagators of this uh, mixed gospel. Now he begins with a defence of his uh, apostleship, which takes us right through uh, to one, from 111 uh, really to two. To two ten, let's just, let's go straight through it. Your knowledge of the Acts of the Apostles, which is where we've been, will help us. I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. I received it through a revelation direct of Jesus Christ, direct in that sense. Now eleven twelve opens up two important ideas. He says, my gospel is not derivative from someone else. And, 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 and I preached it, and it's not according to man. I, haven't, I, I didn't receive it from a man, nor was I taught it by human beings. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's actually saying, my source is Christ himself. That's, that's the origin of what I told you. That's where I first got it. Now, he did check it out, didn't he, with the people of Jerusalem, which he goes on to say. But he said they added nothing to what I said. They had, they had no modifications to do it. And he explains. First he tells them about how he got to be called. I neither received it from man, for you've heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when he, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb, that is, before I was born, and called me through his grace, when he was pleased to reveal his son, not to me, but in me. We'll come to that. That I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. I didn't go to Peter and those guys, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who are apostles before me, I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become, to become acquainted with Kephas, which is the Aramaic for Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. But I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, what I'm writing to you, I assure you, before God, I'm not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. That's when he went back to Tarsus. And I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ, but only they kept hearing. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. So this, this section opens for us his conversion and his conversion direct by Jesus Christ. And he distances himself from the Jerusalem centre because that's where this stuff is coming from. And he says in that rather enigmatic verse, when he who set me apart from my mother's womb called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me. Now what he understands by that is that when a man becomes a Christian or a woman becomes a Christian, then there is a revelation of Jesus Christ in them. That is, anything that brings the change, 
Any fruits of conversion in your life and mine turn out to be a revelation of Jesus Christ in you. Because the life you've received is the life of the Spirit of Christ. And it begins to work itself out in a brand new way of living, which is a revelation of Jesus in him, revealing his Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. In other words, if he didn't have the fruit of the life of Christ in his life, his preaching would hardly be very helpful. Wouldn't be authentic. And he said, he revealed his son in me. And obviously, right from the get-go. Because he said, I didn't go back to Jerusalem, where I came from. I went away to Arabia. And then three years later I went back. But I began preaching straight away. I went to preach that I might preach him among the Gentiles. To the Arabians, I take it. So this is a very important text. What he's actually telling them is, God has revealed his son Jesus Christ in me. So he doesn't say he had a revelation of Christ to me, although he did. Uh, but that's not, not how he chooses to say it. So what's his implication? I am authentic by call and I'm authentic by life. And when you see me come among you, Galatians, as you did, you would have seen the revelation of Jesus Christ in me when I preached. Now, now, we've read enough of Paul to know that by now he often says that. He often says, what sort of men did we prove to be among you? Did, did we rip you off? Did we, did, we, did we want your stuff? Did we want your money? Did we want... No, he said we didn't. Uh, did we keep ourselves ourselves? We did. Did we pay our own weight? We did. Um, were we people who were manipulative of you, that we tried to lord it over your faith? No, we didn't. We said, God is at work within you. Trust him. Uh, this is what we would teach. See that the Holy Spirit confirms that to you. And so what he's saying all the time is, we proved to be men who cared for your conscience and looked after you like fathers to our children. And we were very, very sincere men. And we Now you think, why does he say all that? Because that's what he means in short by saying, Christ in me. God has revealed his son in me. What you've seen in me is a genuine Christian. And that's why he's not afraid to say in other places and later in Timothy, copy me, do what I did. He uses the word mimesco in Greek, which with the word mimic. He's saying, you should copy me. Now, he doesn't mean be a little Paul. and He's not trying to clone people. What he's saying is, if I'm an authentic Christian man who has the revelation of the Son of God in me, then you should copy me, because as I'm copying Christ. Simple as that. So you've got to read this text in the light of the other writings, and then you'd start to see that why he chose the word in me and not to me. Because you might have said, he's just had a revelation of Jesus. That's what he's reporting. Well, he doesn't. Do you notice that? The revelation of Jesus Christ to Paul was not what he preached. What he preached was what Jesus Christ did while he was on the earth. And you see, he's preaching the gospel of Jesus who gave himself up according to, uh, from behalf of our sins, verse 4, 1, 4. So he's actually making clear that Paul didn't recite his message of Jesus from heaven. Because he didn't necessarily have a vision at that point. He had, he had later visions. He says that in 2 Corinthians, doesn't he? I know a man who had visions. But his whole point is, no, it's the revelation of God's Son in me. So when you hear a preacher and when you hear an evangelist, you're looking for the revelation of Jesus Christ in that person. And that's the decisive authenticating fact of what they're preaching really it comes to that. So in Revelation 2 would be more to, the, to Paul's senses uh -huh. and then you'd be taking his word for him seeing what he saw mm. whereas the Revelation in is open to your eyes. I see. Is you... it implying that it's, <clears throat> it's Paul uh, discovering, for want of a better word, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in him? Mm. Yes, but I think it's what he means in 3.1 when he says, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, I see. Yeah, it has to be him, doesn't it? It has to be his life. 
has to be the, 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 the crucified <coughs> life in Paul <coughs> is a portrayal of Jesus Christ as crucified. Mm. Galatians wouldn't have seen him on the cross. Mm. So I think the in me is explained by 3-1. Right. Among the Gentiles, does that mean that's, that's his gospel? That's why he calls it his gospel. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 he, he says, my, my, my audience was Gentile from the get-go. He, he must have had a special revelation. Uh, he didn't need a special revelation too. Yeah, yeah. That came later. Hmm. Mm. Yes, the, 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 yeah, that's right, isn't it? The other apostles walked with Jesus, not knowing who he was, then discovering halfway through who he was. Then he has to change their mind about how they think he is, who they think he is, because he's not really in the way that they've got it right. And then when he dies, they fall over. And then when he resurrects, they, they, they can hardly know their joy again. And then the Spirit of God, after they receive Spirit, they're brand new in boldness and Confidence. Mm. Whereas for Paul, it all comes in one shot. He's a post resurrection convert, but a true apostle whom Christ has commissioned. Many think, as you know, that he was the replacement for Judas in a way that Matthias was by lot, but Paul was by power. But it's it's as you think about it. It's not necessarily. It's never never so stated. Notice that he he um he preaches him among the Gentiles, and I didn't immediately consult with flesh and blood. I didn't go and talk to. He didn't even talk to the man who laid hands on him. That uh, lovely man. I've forgotten his name. And then, Ananias. He didn't say to him, "Instruct me in the faith, brother." He didn't at all. Ha. <laughs> he. He went away to Arabia and listened to God from day one. And you think, okay, so Ananias doesn't instruct him. You would have thought perhaps he might, but he didn't. And he didn't presume to. Now, bear in mind that Paul is a, a heavy hitter from the, from the, from the Jerusalem end. Um, but even so, Ananias would now know something remarkable has happened and the Lord has told him this man is my chosen instrument and he's going to take the gospel before kings and Gentiles and he's going to suffer a heck of a lot. So he says, I didn't, I didn't go up to Jerusalem before he began preaching to those who were apostles. I went away to Arabia and I returned once more to Damascus. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Kephas and stayed with him 15 days. But I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And I assure you before God I'm not lying, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and he says, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ, but only they kept hearing about me. They did hear that I had, I, the persecutor has now joined us, and they were glorifying God because of me. So chapter 1 ends with that statement. But look where he goes from there. Then, after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. And it was because of a revelation that I went up. And I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Implication to the circumcisers who were talking to the Galatians? G Jerusalem never did a thing about Titus. Hello? What are, why are you hearing these circumcisers? But it was because of the false brethren who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. Meaning if we'd yielded to them, we would never have preached a true message to you at all. But for those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. He says, well, those who have reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, as Peter had been to the circumcised, 
For he who effectually works for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. So there was a difference of clientele, you might say, difference of region. And recognising the grace that had been given to me, James and Kephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. So he said they didn't add anything to my gospel. They didn't correct me. They didn't say I was wrong in some things and they'd like to set me straight. He said I had it to their satisfaction and he'd never walked with Jesus ever. That's a pretty significant issue. If ever there's a great proof that the Holy Spirit reminds them, reminds us of the things that Jesus said is Paul. Because Paul is instructed by the Spirit of God, presumably somewhere in Damascus area or Arabia, and he is in a three-year space. He's got a grasp of the gospel, which is that to which the apostolic men add nothing. So this establishes, he's talking about himself, but he must, because what's under threat is his apostleship. See, Paul's got a view, which I think is drawn from Jesus, that if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. If you receive Paul as an apostle of Jesus Christ, you get from an apostle of Christ what you expect to get, which is the true gospel and the revelation of God in him, and you expect to see a godly man who's totally changed from where he was before. And he says, it's important, Galatians, that you first receive me as a true apostle. Well, don't change now. Because if you do, what will happen is you're listening to these other false apostles who are telling you to get circumcised and complete the law and do the works. He said, they're taking them back to works, not grace. And he said, if that's the case, then what you will have done is you will have actually not received a true apostle of Christ for who he was. Now, compute that in terms of the mission of the 12, the mission of the 70. Remember those guys were sent out to every village in Israel and if they were well received, he receives you, receives me, says Jesus. Well, if you receive Paul, you receive Jesus. As simple as that. And if you don't, well, then uh, it's going to be worse for you than Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, see, this is why it's very important for us that we're in a very different place. We've had to grow used to changing the gospel we first heard to bring it in line to the scriptures. And that's why it's hard to do. Because people think if you are teaching them an alternative to what they first heard, unless they found that doesn't work, they think you're attacking the gospel itself. And that's why people don't hear you. Until they're desperate and they know it's not working, then they will. And this is important. This is, I found this to be my experience over a, a long period of time now, is that, is that people who are satisfied with where they are and think it's all going hunky-dory for them, an expression that means happiness, right? Uh, if they do, they won't listen to an alternative sound. But if they're desperate, they will. And people are desperate because they're finding it doesn't quite work. Now he involves an issue. He now goes further. He says, I rebuked Peter, you know. When Kephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Prior to the coming of certain men from James, that's James of Jerusalem, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. This is Peter. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result, even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But Paul stood up. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. So he doesn't say something rude. He doesn't say they, 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 they had a yuck idea. or he doesn't, he doesn't put it down. What he says is, it's just not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. They're not, in a straightforward way, applying the truth of the gospel. 
I said to Kephas in the presence of them all, if you, being a Jew, live like Gentiles and do not like Jews and, and not like Jews, how is it you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? So if so if, if, if you've abandoned living as a Jew and can live as a Gentile, why do you think you'd want to make them live like a Jew? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Sinners means that word in, a, in the classic sense of a Pharisee, a non-Jew. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, that is in Messiah Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Now you have got there a summary of Romans 2 and 3. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? Did Christ make us sinners by abandoning the law? No, 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 no. For if I rebuild what I've once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. If, if I go back to Judaism, he said, all I'm going to get out of that is I'm a lawbreaker and it will tell me that again and I'm just another transgressor. For through the law I died to the law that I might live to God. What does he mean by through the law? I died to the law that I might live to God come back I'm going to finish the text and return I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live but Christ lives in me now that's what I think he means by manifested his son in me or revealed his son in me he thinks Christ is living in him which of course he is um, by the spirit and his whole point is God is revealing his son in me. And here he says, Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, that is, as a mortal man who will die, I live by faith in the Son of God. But the Greek text reads, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. He's back to the deliverance bit again from chapter 1, verse 4. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died for nothing. That is, if the law could have made you righteous, there's no need for Jesus Christ to come. But if it couldn't, there was a desperate need that he must come. Now, this is a very difficult set of texts, and you could preach on this for some time now. But it's important to know that it's, a, it's a, just, a, it's just we've got 10 minutes, and I want to take you through it so that you're clear as to something of what it means. But you won't hear it all until you get to chapter 4 and 5, particularly 5. And it's very helpful to see how it's laid out in the Greek text because it's laid out in a form which actually uh, puts it in very sharp, little, uh, tight statements. Uh, so he's looking at... We're looking here at, uh, at uh, what we... Well, let's just start there at um, 2.19, somewhere there. So he is going to put it out in, in this form. He's going to say, For I, through the law... I'm just going to give you a literal translation. For I, through law, died to the law. But he puts it in this way, and this is something like we've got. Perhaps if I do it another way, you'll get it right. He's actually going to put it like this. He's going to say that I, through law, and then. Now, the Greek word for law is nomos. And here you've got something here. Uh, this, is, this is for. For I, ego is very emphatic. I, through for I. Through the law, this is a preposition, and this case tells you that it means through. And then he adds it in the dative case, which is an instrument in this case. 
instrumental dative. So he's saying, I, through the law, by the law, by the law, or as an instrument, died. And the way he writes this, that he died, uh, is that he uses a tense here which is, which is just simply a point of end. Something that happened. Boom. And the reason he died, he now gives an adverbial clause of reason. In order that, uh, to God, I might live. Now, you can see what he's doing here. For I, through the law, by the law, died. So, for I died. And the for means there's something that's gone before it, which he's carrying the argument through. You know how we often say in English, you know, um, uh, well, we should catch a bus to the city for there are so many that run. <laughs> now, my for talks about catching a bus, but now gives the reason why we should catch one for there are so many, you know. So for takes the argument and brings it forward and expands it a little. So what was the argument that's expanded? Look at 2.18. For if I build up again that which I destroyed, I become a transgressor. So he's actually saying this. If I rebuild what I once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For... So the bit about being a transgressor and rebuilding, and that's what he's saying these, these false apostles are doing. They're, they're rebuilding. <laughs> they're going back to Judaism. And they're saying, let's, let's arc up Judaism again. He said, if you do that, all you'll end up as a transgressor for. And so how does this take the argument forward? He said, the law, will, the law will tell you what you are. The only thing it can ever tell you is you've broken me. Uh, you've transgressed. The law brings you condemnation because it tells you that you've transgressed. He says, for, through the law, by the law I died. Why? Why did I die? In order that I might live to God. In other words, he's actually saying, the law is something that not only have I died through it, I've died by it. If you're going to take me back to law, I only know that as an instrument by which I died so that I might live to God. So he sees his dying as something which has come through the law, but he's also by the law or using the law. He's died. The law brought me to a death. What does he mean by this? How, how does he understand that? In rebuilding what is destroyed, is he also saying when you apologise for something, you're admitting guilt? Yeah. Or when you attempt to fix something, that implies that it's broken. So had these Judaizers been able to find life in the law, yeah. then they would never have needed anything else because... Mm. That's right. They, they would have had life. Which makes sense of the last verse. That... Uh, that um, if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died for nothing. The point is it doesn't. It doesn't. It makes you a transgressor. Notice this doesn't mean the law is evil or bad. It's of God. But as Paul will tell you in a more, in a more expanded statement in Romans 7, but the flesh, that power in our mortal body, uses the law to bring me to death. So he says, the law kills me. Now, we've already heard him on this, haven't we, in 2 Corinthians 4, somewhere down that road, 3, 4, that the law is an instrument of death. It's a ministry of death. Whereas, in actual fact, um, the law is just... Uh, and, and the law came in to increase the trespass, as we saw in Romans 5. See, Paul's understanding is the law brings you to death. And the important point is, and it should, because it's through the law... You died to the law. But if you die to law, what does that mean? It means that it's, it's, the best thing I know about it is like the, the, like the slaves in America who you know, would sing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, coming forward to carry me home. What their understanding is, when I die, I get free from this master. And my death is a release from this slavery 
and bondage to this master. Now, Paul understands that his death to law means he can now live to God. So you must die to the one master so that you can live to another. This is Romans 6, isn't it? That he's now, sorry, put that out in Romans 6. And so this is a very truncated, very tight, very condensed uh, summary. So he's saying, let's not go back to law, my friends. If we do that, we'll die. And anyway, we've already died. And we've died to the law. We're no longer living in respect that the law is the thing we first look at. We're living to God. We've turned from living to law to living to God. Doesn't make us lawless, but it does mean it's not the drive we're sucking our life from. There is no life in the law for us. And then he makes this comment. Well, it's not a comment. It's a tight little run. I have been. Notice the, notice the past tense. It's, it's a perfect tense. I have been crucified with Christ. Now, we need to take time to look at that. But basically, he's going to tell you Romans 6 there. Remember how Romans 6 he would say, all those who have been baptised into Christ have been baptised into his death. And he's going to go on and talk about the fact that to be baptised into Christ... Remember, he gave us a parallel in 1 Corinthians 10 about being baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That is, in this leader, God has brought a deliverance. And God brought a deliverance to Israel through Moses. And in the cloud and in the sea meant in the presence of God, the cloud, and in the sea was where it was done. We walked through the sea. And so he would say, to be baptised into Christ Jesus is to be baptised into his death. So Christ's crucifixion is seen as ours. Not because we were there with him, but because he was there on our behalf and has caught us up in him as a true representative of us. So I've been crucified with Christ. If that's the case, I'm dead. My, it's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. That's the resurrection side of that issue. Dying and rising with Christ is a big theme in Paul, Romans 6 to 8. And he says, the life which I now live in the flesh, that is, I'm still living in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. I'm meaning I've got a share in, in Jesus' faith. It's the faith of the Son of God who died believing his father would raise him. And so I live by the faith of the Son of God who went through that death, burial, resurrection in faith. I, I, I live by that man's faith. And he loved me and delivered himself up for me. But by saying that, he doesn't mean that Paul was the only person Christ died for. But he does, personif he does make it personal because he begins with, I have been crucified with Christ. So he's talking about his own personal experience, but he's not saying that in a way that would preclude anybody else. Got any questions about that section? It's a very, I've been pretty slick on it, but it's, it, you've got to see that it is a tight section. Very, it's a very famous question for all exam papers in theology. People will give you 217, 21, and say, comment. <laughs> And they want five pages <laughs> because they want you to really give back the, the, the theology of personal life that comes to us through participating in the life of Jesus Christ by the Spirit and at the same time to be free from law. All that is contained in this little four-verse, little compressed tablet. Really, it's just like a tablet then. And by the way, that brings his argument of that section to the end because he's now going on to exhort them, you foolish Galatians. He's now moving from his authority to their experience. So he said, I want to argue the case as to why my gospel is authentic and theirs is not. First, has to do with me. I'm genuine. Second, has to do with my track record in the way in which I brought you this material. Third, has to do with the fact that I've stood up for the same thing even to Peter, for goodness sake, about this matter. And, 
and he yielded to that. Now, if Peter yielded to my arguments, really, Galatians, you should listen to me and not to these dudes. That's the implication. And now he's going to appeal to their experience. See, he's not talking to people who've never heard the gospel, like some armchair theologian who's filling up some ideas. He's saying, you people are Christians, for goodness sake. You know the power of God. You know the change in your life. And you understand this is the case. I can't believe someone's bewitched you. They've just tricked you. There's, some, some, there's something else happening here. That's too much. We should stop. But it's important to see at chapter 2 of Galatians, uh, it's a very strong, personally based argument, but actually not so because he's now got to the content of the gospel. Now, that's how he's used this um, uh, interdiction of Peter, where he's, got, where he's called Peter to account, and then he's actually brought forth his argument of the gospel. He sort of, um, it's sort of segued into that. He, he's begun with himself, but he's now talking gospel truth. And he's made it into a little tight summary. And that's also important, isn't it? Because his little tight summary um, would be a summary that you would expect him, that Peter would understand. In other words, this is apostle to apostle. <laughs> so he's actually saying to Peter, Peter, let me just remind you of these big four things. Dup, 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 dup. And, you, and you and I as readers would say, oh, what's that about? But Peter would get that. Be standard stuff, which, by the way, it tells us <clears throat> that this Pauline way of expressing the gospel doesn't start with Paul. Peter would have understood what he meant. Because you'll notice in your text, and certainly in mine, the inverted commas starts from 14 all the way through to 21. He's quoting what he said to Peter. When did Peter get the message for the Gentiles? Obviously here he hasn't got it right. He hasn't. He hasn't got it right, has he? Uh, well, his life is not right. He's not straightforward. What Paul is saying is... Right. Yeah, I think he's saying to Peter, you're inconsistent here. Let me show you this. This is not good. I don't think he's saying you don't know the gospel. I think he's saying you're not straightforward about its truth. Mm. This could have been new to Peter, though, could it not? Uh, could have been. Perhaps the word for might be. Yeah. We know the word for is Pauline. Right. We also know that one Peter says... Our brother Paul does write things that are hard to understand, <laughs> yeah. uh, if that is Peter. So, yeah, could be. Hmm. Might be new, but, but I doubt it. Right. Paul makes the inference that Peter accepted it and Paul was right. Yes. So Peter, Peter, had, was wrong. P Peter accepted the rebuke yes. as, as true yeah. and didn't quarrel about the, it didn't go on to quarrel with the data. Yeah. Yeah, Although if he did, Paul doesn't report it. No wonder Luther lectured on this for three years, this text. And his book is just amazing. Because here is all the issues of the gospel mm -hmm. in a context when the gospel was not understood at all, but was works and, 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 and. and. Lord our Heavenly Father who has sent us your Son and uh, it's by your will that your Son was sent to us and on our behalf and in our place and in our stead we worship you today we thank you that you have prepared for us in your Son wonderful things we thank you that the reception of your Spirit brings about a revelation of the Son of God in us And we ask your forgiveness where our life does not parallel the power of what lies within us in Jesus Christ by the Spirit. We thank you for this man. He could have a confidence that he had portrayed a true Christian before these people. And we thank you for his insistence that they hear the gospel he preached as the authentic thing, not some other thing. 
We thank you there is no other gospel. There's no other good news, really. There are distortions of it, but it's always a distortion of the real thing, not some other thing that stands by itself. I want to thank you for his forthrightness, for his sureness with the Galatians that they had experienced the true gospel because they had some experience he could, he could appeal to. And we thank you we could read this tonight and ask you to help us take it into ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.